Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, so first, I want to get a couple warnings out of the way. I was apparently hungry when I made these slides, so there's the occasional breakfast reference in the talk. Um, and also, uh, despite the title having the word quantum in it twice, I'm actually going to do my best to remove as much quantum uh, notation terminology as possible. So if you're hoping to get uh, knee deep in Braquette notation, uh, I'm sorry to disappoint. Uh, OK, so um, I, I take it we're all familiar with the random oracle model. Um, the, the idea is that you have a crypto system that uses some hash function. And maybe we don't know how to prove security using collision resistance. So what we might do is pretend that the hash function is actually a truly random function and allow the adversary to query the random function um, in addition to the, the crypto system. All right. So why is the random oracle model useful? Well, to illustrate uh, why it might be useful, uh, think about how we would actually simulate the oracle in the security proof. Uh, using, we can do this uh, essentially on the fly, where every time the adversary makes a query, we just uh, sample the output of the oracle for that input at that given point uh, and leave all the parts that the adversary hasn't queried yet um, undefined. So what the result of this is that we get a database of input-output pairs that the adversary sees. And so this allows us, the, by looking at this database, we know what inputs the adversary cares about, because they're just the inputs in the database. We know the corresponding outputs, because they're just in the other column of the database. Um, we can even do some clever things, like adaptively program the outputs um, as, we're, as we're doing the simulation. And we can also very easily analyze bad events, such as uh, you know, whether the adversary is able to find a collision or not. Uh, so, so way back in 2011, we asked the question of what happens when we move to quantum. So now uh, we have a quantum adversary. And in the real world, the quantum adversary can interact with the hash function on quantum inputs because the, the adversary evaluates the hash function for themselves. So in the random oracle model, it only makes sense to model the random oracle model as, as, a, as a function that's queryable on quantum inputs. OK, but here's the problem. So, so remember this classical on-the-fly simulation where every time the adversary makes a query, we record that input and we write down the corresponding output. Uh, suddenly, this becomes much trickier in quantum. And the reason has to do with uh, something that I'll just call the observer effect, which says that uh, whenever you learn something about a quantum system, you necessarily risk disturbing that system. And now, if we think about it, the, the random oracle is this answering these queries obliviously? The random oracle isn't trying to learn anything about the adversary. So in our reduction, if the reduction is trying to learn anything about the adversary, such as learn what the query points that the adversary is interested in, it seems like the reduction is going to end up uh, disturbing the adversary. Uh, so you know, basically, uh, the takeaway from this seems to be that the reduction actually has to answer obliviously too, or else it's easily distinguishable from the random oracle. All right, so, so to, to get around this issue, what you do is, rather than use these, uh, on, this on-the-fly simulation, what you do instead is you handcraft some distribution on functions that hopefully is indistinguishable from a random function. But the, the point is that you fix it at the very beginning of the experiment and just obliviously use this function to answer the random oracle queries. And this is, this is how typical proofs in the quantum random oracle model work. Uh, but there's a number of limitations. Because we're answering obliviously, we don't know the inputs that the adversary cares about. We don't know the corresponding outputs. You can do some sort of programming, but it can't be adaptive, because you had to do the programming at the very beginning of the experiment. Um, and it also becomes much, much less obvious how to analyze bad events. And basically, you have to prove quantum query complexity lower bounds to do so. OK, but despite these limitations, there have actually been a number of positive results. Um, but uh, there's some major holdouts. And the, the, the major holdout I want to talk about today, and the one that I address in this work, is um, something called indifferentiable domain extension. OK, so here's, here's the, the core question. Uh, consider Merkle Damgard. And suppose that the, the hash function that we're starting from, is, the, 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 the compression function, uh, is a random oracle. Is the, is the Merkle Damgard construction obtained from this? Does it also look like a random oracle? 
And it turns out that the answer is yes. The way, we sh the way this is shown is using something called indifferentiability. I won't really spend any time defining it, but uh, indifferentiability is basically a real world versus ideal world thing, where in the real world, you have, uh, you have the, the compression function being a random oracle and the, the big hash function being merkle damgard And in the ideal world, you have um, the big hash function being a random oracle and the little function being simulated, and the adversary is trying to tell the difference. Okay, and uh, yeah, the indifferentiability implies that uh, ran that Merkle Damgard is as good as a random oracle in a wide variety of settings. Okay, so now moving to quantum, uh, basically we just give the adversary quantum access to everything um, and ask for uh, indistinguishability to hold. Okay, but here's a problem. So remember the the traditional random oracle model, quantum random oracle model proof technique fixes how it's going to answer queries at the very beginning and just fixes that once and for all. In the context of indifferentiability, this basically corresponds to the simulator being stateless. But it's actually a really easy theorem to show that stateless simulation is impossible for domain uh, extension, and this holds classically quantumly whatever. And the idea is basically a stateless simulator allows you to compress a truth table for the big hash function into a truth table for a little hash function because these truth tables are random. Uh, you, you get it a contradiction. Okay, so this is the question. Uh, okay, so in this work, we, an we actually, uh, perhaps surprisingly, answer this question positively and, say, and show that actually we can do indifferentiable domain extension, and the core technique is a new way to do on-the-fly simulation, uh, but for quantum random oracles. Okay, so let's just jump right into the idea. Uh, so the first step is we're going, to take, we're going to take this uniform distribution over functions, and we're going to do something called purification, which is really just uh, turning this uh, classical probability distribution into a quantum state. I won't really say what this is, but it's some, it's some weird quantum state such that if you try to actually peer inside it and measure it, uh, things are going to, uh, basically you're gonna recover the uniform distribution, you're gonna destroy the quantum state and recover the uniform distribution, and so this purification process can be thought of as sort of the opposite of uh, quantum measurements. Um, I do want to get a, one little annoying um, thing out of the way. Quantum computation is reversible, and so we have to model our quantum queries as a reversible computation. Um, so the way we do this is the adversary's query actually contains an input and an output, and the result of the query basically just XORs the query output into the the value supplied by the adversary. Okay, um, so why did, why did quantifi quantifying the random oracle model do, some, do anything useful? Um, well, a, a consequence of the, the wave particle duality is that we can basically interpret quantum states as signals. And once we have a, a signal, we can do Fourier analysis. And I, I don't know if there's a, a name for this, but there's this uh, nice principle that I'll just call reciprocity which says that if, a, if you have two systems, quantum systems, and system A is acting on system B in the primal domain, when you look at it in the Fourier domain, when you do your Fourier analysis, what you actually see that's happening is that system B is acting on system A. And this, this uh, reciprocity has been used um, in a lot of places. It was used in a lot of these old impossibility results for unconditionally secure um, quantum protocols. And it was also, it's also the idea behind this uh, classical result that quantum authentication implies encryption. And, and um, ho hopefully it's not too hard to see how this happens. So if, you know, if you say if you had a quantum authentication scheme and it did not imply encryption, if you're actually able to learn something about the state, uh, well, that means that's essentially saying that the, the, the encryption is acting on your state because you're able to learn about it. So when you look at the Fourier domain, it says that you, you are actually acting on the quantum state, therefore violating authentication. Okay, and uh, the proof of this is basically very simple, uh, just basically using simple rules of Fourier transform, where, um, so system A acting on system B in the primal domain if, if we think of our operations as linear, basically corresponds to an upper triangular matrix uh, being applied to the system. And when we look at things in the Fourier domain, uh, applying a linear transformation, 
it turns out to be another linear transformation in the Fourier domain, and the, the linear transformation is just the inverse transpose. And when you inverse transpose an upper triangular matrix, you get a lower triangular matrix, which corresponds to system B acting on system A. All right, so what we're, do, what we're gonna do is we're gonna sort of turn things on their head. We're going to look at the Fourier domain. And uh, if we actually sort of work out uh, this transpose inverse, what happens is something really interesting. So the adversary's query again is this xy, and the oracle state is this h hat. And what happens is the initial oracle state is just zero, corresponding to the fact that the uniform distribution or the constant signal has all its mass in the Fourier domain on the or at the origin. Um, and the update procedure actually, as expected by the reciprocity, updates the oracle. And it updates it in this interesting way where basically we add to the oracle a point function that an input x outputs y and outputs zero everywhere else. Okay. So the, once we have this, the next idea is that um, because our oracle is now just the sum of all these point functions, right? It started out at, as zero, and we're just every query we're adding a point function, we can actually compress it. So after Q queries, this function is non-zero at, at most Q points. So all we have to do is just represent our oracle instead of this giant truth table, we just represented it as all the non-zero points, right? Um, and so this is, you know, very simple to, to write down what the update procedure is for this compressed um, version of our oracle. So it, we've, we, it looks like we've made progress. We have that the oracle's state now is a database of input-output pairs. It's, you know, small. And in fact, the, the inputs correspond to the adversary's queries. The inputs are exactly the points that the adversary queried, um, or, or at least some subset thereof. Uh, the problem is that the, the outputs are these weird Fourier coefficients, basically, um, and they don't really correspond to uh, outputs of the oracle. So all we do then is after we do this compression, we revert back to the primal domain, and uh, now things are looking pretty good. The input still remains the points that the adversary queried, and the output is approximately the corresponding outputs of the oracle. There's a, there's a caveat that I'll get to in a couple slides, though. And actually, remarkably, if you, if you work out the details of what the, of the update procedure for, this, uh, for these databases, it's actually very similar to the, the classical on-the-fly simulation. The main difference is that occasionally we actually have to erase. And the reason is if you, if you sort of think about what's happening in the Fourier domain, if you, uh, you know, query on the same point function twice, uh, the, the effects will cancel and you'll actually remove a point from your database and this, this uh, also happens after we revert back to the primal domain. Whereas classically, you never forget anything. All right, so um, I, I call these things compressed oracles and they solve a lot of the problems that we had with uh, the traditional approaches for the quantum random oracle. It allows us to know what the inputs the adversary cares about. They're just the X columns of our database. We know the corresponding outputs, there's the Y columns. Uh, this, this, uh, uh, so far this approach doesn't let you do any programming, um, but actually later on in this session, um, in some subsequent work, we, we actually do um, show how to program. Um, and also it turns out you can easily analyze uh, bad events like collisions. It's much harder than classical still, but easier than it was uh, before. Okay, so what happened? We had, we had this argument that we had to do uh, we had to do our, our reduction having the, uh, fixing the oracle at the very beginning. So how did we get around that? And it turns out that the, the, the core problem, which was this observer effect, actually also offers our solution. Um, so it, intuitively what's happening is the adversary is actually learning about the, the hash function, h, through its queries. Um, and w so by quantumifying the random oracle, we see that by the observer effect, when the adversary learns anything about the oracle, the adversary actually had to disturb the oracle. Um, so as the adversary is making queries, he's necessarily affecting the, the random oracle, and the, the compressed oracles basically offer a way to decode this disturbance. Now there are caveats. Um, so because of the way we did the compression, in the, if you recall in the Fourier domain, for the compression, we're only storing the points that are non-zero. So for all the points in the database, once we've reverted back to the primal domain, we've effectively removed the, uh, the, the constant Fourier coefficient. And th this 
causes some small error. So the, the Y values aren't exactly the query outputs. They're close, but not exact. And then there's the, the additional problem that examine, if we actually took this database and we tried to examine it, it's, it's this funny quantum state and learning anything about it is going to disturb it and potentially mess up the whole system. Uh, so we have to actually still be very careful about how we use this database. But nonetheless, uh, this, this technique is good enough for many applications. It turns out it gives you exactly the right, just coincidentally it seems, exactly the right information needed to do a simulation for quantum indifferentiability of Merkle Damgard. Um, it turns out we can also reprove uh, a lot of existing quantum lower bounds in a more unified and maybe direct approach. Uh, and we also show the CCA security of plain Fujisaki Okamoto. Uh, there have been a number of, of variants that have been proven secure, but we were able to show that the original scheme is secure. Um, and and since, our, since this work, uh, there have been a number of follow-up works showing many more applications. Um, so with that, I'll conclude and just uh, finish with the message that when working with uh, quantum random oracles, always purify your oracle. A few minutes for questions. Please come to the microphone. <clears throat> There's something which bothers me about uh, the model you presented. You say that when you are making a query, you are modifying the oracle um, uh, with that point function. If you are querying the same point again, then it is cancelled. Exactly. And if I'm going to query the oracle a third time, will I get the original uh, answers in the first and second, or will I get a different one? Uh, I, I think the right answer is that the question is not really well defined, but uh, maybe the, the intuitive answer is no, you actually won't, aren't guaranteed to get the same answer. But in order to actually, if, if you think about querying twice, at, at, the end of that, at the end of the second query, you actually know nothing about the oracle, so it's, it's okay that the oracle answered differently. But in this second. sense, it's different than the classical model it is, of yes. uh, random oracle. It is different. Or the, 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 the model is the same. This is just in the proof. Right? In the proof, we're saying we're going, to take the, we're going to take the classical random probability distribution and replace it with a quantum state, and it has this property. But the, the original model still just has a random, a random oracle that's fixed at the very beginning. Thanks. It's good to see you, Hirati. Uh, one more question. Could you go back to the, the follow-up work? Are there any particular applications that still remain you know, not well addressed by the technique? Um, I, I mean, there, there's you know, many papers that have not yet been proven secure in the random oracle model. I think for me, the, perhaps the most interesting open question right now is if you can um, show that the random oracle model implies the ideal cipher model. Um, so basically e extending the indifferentiability to um, these constructions of, of ideal ciphers. Any other questions? All right, let's thank Mark again.